Candy. Candy. Welcome, everybody. So I have kind of a, um, a, a plan for the night. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, I think that uh, my feeling when I move from step one into step two is, yay, I'm out of step one. Um, step one usually feels uh, pretty bleak to me. There's a lot of sadness, a lot of honesty in looking at what's really happening in my life instead of kind of what I've been pretending is happening in my life. Um, and the spiritual principles behind step two are hope and open-mindedness, which is great. So my hope for all of you is that you either gave some thought or put pen to paper on some of the nine areas of unmanageability that we talked about last week, right? Having trouble with personal relationships, prey to misery and depression, full of fear, couldn't make a living, feelings of uselessness, couldn't be of real help to others. All of those things that when we get here is kind of eating our lunch. Um, one of the things I've said before about step one is if I have more than two or three of those up, two or three of those nine areas of unmanageability, might be a good idea to go through the steps again with a sponsor and see if I can take off yet another layer. I don't believe I'm an onion. I prefer to refer, refer to myself as an archeological dig because <laughs> I like it better. Um, but you know, the steps are meant to be gone through over and over and over again. And my own personal experience has been that they work for whatever's up with me. They're very, very effective. So step two, who knows what step two says? Came? To believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Good. Um, I like to kind of take that step apart just a little bit. So it says we came to believe. So that indicates that we're making a change, right? That we haven't believed in the past, but that we're going to come to believe. Come to believe what? that a power greater than ourselves, very nonspecific, mm -hmm. right? A power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Let's talk a little bit about that phrase, a power greater than ourselves. Um, it, the steps use the word God, and I think it's because it's a word that most people can relate to. Most people at least kind of have a basic understanding of what that word might mean. Mm -hmm. But for people who are non-religious, who are agnostic or atheist, they don't need to believe in God to use the steps. They just don't, right? Mm -hmm. What they have to believe is that they're going to need a power greater than themselves to be restored to sanity. So in step one, we tell the truth and surrender. In step two, we come to believe. And for me, I came to believe that left to my own devices, what was going on with me was going to continue going on with me as it had for many, many years, right? You guys probably have all heard the Al-Anon uh, definition of insanity. Insanity is we keep doing the same things over and over again, expecting different results. It's really appropriate for Al-Anon's. It's a great definition of insanity. So um, in step two, we come to believe that we can be restored to sanity. Um, how do I suggest that people work step two? Well, when people are in step one and I'm working with them, I have them write on the nine areas of unmanageability in their lives. I ask them, please do not write me a book. Like a paragraph for each is sufficient, thank you, because um, uh, it's, it's enough to kind of get at the meat of what's going on with us, right? In step two, I ask that same person to take those areas that they wrote about in step one and to imagine that love, God, a power greater than myself is in charge now of this messy, unmanageable, cuckoo, sometimes heartbreaking stuff that's going on in my life. And what I say to them is I want you to think big. 
and I want you to think as big as you can on what those nine areas would look like in your life if love, the power of the universe, God, were calling the shots instead of you, right? And when, when I came here, um, my behavior, my beliefs, my insanity had put me in a life-threatening place with my Al-Anon issues. And I really wanted to die. Um, and when I was thinking about step two for the <laughs> first time, I wanted to not want to die. <laughs> that was kind of my big goal, like, come on in. Come on in. So um, that was a good goal for me initially, right? But I, I try to get my sponsees to think a little bigger than that. Like, what would it look like if your life really were creating joy, were creating abundance? You had healthy relationships with the people around you. Al Anon is a disease of dependence, a disease of dependence, right? So when an alcoholic is act, acting out or a drug act, addict is acting out in their disease, their behavior can look very extreme, right? Like I have heard some fascinating stories in some AA meetings. The best one was a guy who um, stole an RTD bus, <laughs> took off his clothes, oh my and drove it around town until he got stopped, <laughs> right? So. That man, if he made it to the doors of AA, you know, he could look at his behavior and say, that was a questionable decision <laughs> on my part, right? <laughs> Potentially, that was not a good thing to do, and you know, and I can see that, right? But with Al-Anon's, this disease of dependence, it's a disease of dependence, often doesn't look very nutty, right? It, it doesn't always look very crazy, and yet, right, and yet, um, Al-Anon, the family disease of alcoholism, kills everybody. It doesn't just kill the alcoholic, it kills everybody. So um, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is what keeps us trapped in our disease, right? Al-Anon is a disease of dependence. I'll probably bring this writing in one week, but in the book AA Comes of Age, there's a beautiful article written by Bill W. And it was after he had been sober for 20 plus years, if I remember correctly. And he says in this, this beautiful like essay that his dependence, his absolute dependence on people and prestige, right? His codependent issues almost took him out. They almost killed him, right? So when I got here as an Al-Anon, it was, I, I had umbrage with that word insanity, you know, because after all, you know, wasn't I the one? Wasn't I the one? Wasn't I the one that took care of things? Wasn't I the one that tried to fix things? Wasn't I the one, right? Um, but understanding the insanity of our Al-Anon behavior is very, very important, right? When we can't live our own lives, when we need people to be different so that we'll be okay, right? That's codependence. That's the disease of dependence. And what do Al-Anons do about that? They sometimes very sweetly manage, manipulate, martyr, and mother, the four M's, the four M's. Manage, manipulate, martyr, and mother. When I started writing inventory, that word martyr came up so much that I made a decision that it should be taken out of the dictionary so that <laughs> I could escape it somehow, right? We imagine that what we're doing, that our behavior is actually good for the people around us. In reality, it's hurting the people around us, right? Um, the best thing an Al-Anon can do for a person who's sick is get out of the way. Like, get out of the way. I call let it burn. Let it burn. Because 
similarly to Al-Anon's, alcoholics don't usually want to admit that they're powerless over alcohol, right? And that their life is unmanageable. So if you were here last week, you heard me talk about my attraction to alcoholics and handing out cards that say, I'm attracted to you, you're an alcoholic. <laughs> Get yourself into the nearest treatment center right away. Right, we're attracted to them. Alcoholics are attracted to Al-Anons, why? Mm -hmm. Because there's this synergistic thing where there's a, there's a trading, there's mm -hmm. trading going on, right? Like real love relationships are not about trading, <laughs> right? I'll give you this if you give me that. I'll make you feel better if you make me feel better. I'll pretend you're okay if you'll pretend I'm okay, mm -hmm. right? So the Al-Anon behaviors around that, um, actually, when I realized that my behavior was making uh, the person I loved most in the world sicker, that was a God moment for me, you know? Because when we try to make everything better so that people don't feel the pain of what's really going on, it prolongs the disease, right? It's unkind, it's, un it's not love, friends, it's not love, right? We just, we just keep people sicker, we keep ourselves sicker. And, and the, I thought a lot about step two this week because I knew Friday was gonna come. And one of the things I thought about was, um, oh gosh, I just lost my thought on that. Well, it'll come back if it's important. So understanding that our behavior is insane, even if it's subtle, more subtle than driving an RTD bus naked through the city, <laughs> might be more subtle than that, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's less dangerous, mm -hmm. right? It really doesn't. It affects the family as negatively as active alcoholism, active drug addiction, active mental illness, whatever might be going on in the family. So step two says we come to believe, right? that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. It can be the power of the group. It can be the power of the steps. It can be the, in some, sometimes it's okay if it's our relationship with our sponsor that kind of holds that spot for us as we start down this road to recovery. Um, so that's what I have to say so far on dissecting step two. I thought it would be good, um, and I gave you guys homework because I told you last week I'm bossy. Um, the homework is listed up here. Uh, I'd like you to define the pages in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous where step one and two are talked about and defined. I'd like you to read the AA 12 by 12, 12 steps and 12 traditions. If you follow along in this as we discuss the steps, you'll get more out of it, I think. This is the expert source. I'm just a person who likes to talk out loud. Um, I like to get that. Define pages in the big book. Which yeah. Step one and two are defined. defined. Yep. It's in the first 164 pages. Define the pages. It'll tell you. Okay. Yeah. It'll tell you is it where you get to step three. Yeah. So just look in the first 164 pages and look for where the big book talks about step one and step two. So find, it should say find the pages in the big book where those two steps are defined. I, that's a typo, or it's not a typo because it's not typed. Um, and then uh, read, uh, read along in the 12 by 12. I also think it would be fun next week if you have them to bring your own musical references um, or a poem that talks about step three to you. We might not have time to look at all of them. But last week, you know, um, we did some music and poetry around the steps because this is a workshop, not a meeting, and we can. So I'd like to jump into the AA 12 by 12 and talk a little bit about step two and what it says in this book about step two. So again, just, just you know, change the words around a little bit from alcoholic to al -Anon or whatever works for you. So it's talking about um, the alcoholic gets to step two and they feel like they're over a barrel. They've already admitted powerlessness and unmanageability and now they're being asked to believe in a power greater than themselves. Let's look first at the case of the one who says he won't believe 
the belligerent one. He is in a state of mind which can be described only as savage. His whole philosophy of life in which he is so glorified is threatened. It's bad enough, he thinks, to admit alcohol has him down for keeps. But now, still smarting from that admission, he is faced with something really impossible. And that's that willingness to surrender to a power greater than ourselves. And then at this, the sponsor usually laughs. And so it is, he says, the sponsor, the beginning of the end of the old life and the beginning of your emergence into a new one. So that powerlessness and giving up in step one, seeing the unmanageability, being honest about it, sets us up for step two, where we can start to emerge into a new life. And then it goes on to say, listen, if you will, to these three statements. First, Alcoholics Anonymous does not demand that you believe anything. Isn't that cool? When I got here, I was in a very, 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 very strict um, Christian religion, maybe could be called a cult, and I was pretty brainwashed by that. And so I, I would sit in this room full of people, lovely people, who were so kind to me. But while we were sitting there, I would be like, you know, none of you have God's favor and you're all going to die. Because <laughs> that's what my religion believed, right? If someone had pushed back on me about that when I was new, Anybody want to guess what would have happened? You would have left. I would have disappeared. Mm -hmm. I would have been gone in a flash because I was invested in that belief, right? Mm -hmm. So for us, for others, for the people we work with, it's important that we not, that we allow them, right? Their own belief in a power greater than themselves. That makes working with agnostics an atheist easier for me. I'm not an agnostic and I'm not an atheist. But I don't need people that are to be different. Mm -hmm. I just don't. It's not required. Goes on to say, all of its 12 steps are but suggestions. That's the first thing. Second, to get sober and to stay sober, you don't have to swallow all of step two right now. Looking back, I find that I took it piecemeal myself. Third, all you really need is a truly open mind, right? So Al-Anons like AAs usually show up here somewhat beaten into submission. <laughs> I showed up here somewhat beaten into submission, right? I, I opened a crack. I, I opened my mind a crack. And what I say is when I'm willing to change and I'm willing to heal, and I, have the, I was pretty close-minded, but I had a little bit of open-mindedness, right? God can work with that, right? Higher power can work with that. Um, there's a song that says that the crack is where, you know, the love gets in. You only, it only needs a crack, mm -hmm. right? So, but it's a beginning. Um, then it goes on to say, it's talking about being defiant. So it's talking about changing your mind and, and letting the steps begin to work on you. And then it says, to acquire this, I only had to stop fighting, stop fighting, and practice the rest of AA's program as enthusiastically as I could. Pretty basic. And then it says uh, later on that page, even a minimum of faith will be enough. Then I thought this was interesting too. Consider next the plight of those who once had faith but have lost it. There will be those who have drifted into indifference, those filled with self-sufficiency who have cut themselves off, those who have become prejudiced against religion and are downright defiant because God has failed to fulfill their demands. Right? Right, I really thought if I told God what to do enough that God would do it. <laughs> I did. I really thought that for a long time. But there's this beautiful thing called free will that is built into the system, right? God never makes anybody do anything. God does not make people behave. 
Do you guys watch the news? <laughs> Where what's going on? God does not make people behave. What does God do? God helps me change me, change my mind, change what I believe, move forward in a way that's love-based, and that changes everything for me. Okay? So the miracle is for who? Me. It's for you. It's for you. It's not for all those people you love so much who you cannot make behave. I was the queen of trying to make people behave. I did it for a long time. It's what that church was about for me in the end. I thought if I could just behave well enough and if I could make my kids behave well enough, that we'd all be somehow okay, right? It didn't work. It didn't work. Then it talks about self-sufficiency, and it talks about people that are far too smart for their own good. Mm -hmm. We love to have people call us precocious. We use our education, our education, our money, our jobs, our whatever, our car, mm -hmm. um, to blow ourselves up into prideful balloons though we were careful to hide this from others. <laughs> so much fun to hide that stuff from others. Secretly, we felt we could float above the rest of the folks on our brain power alone. So one of my favorite lines in the big book is that any life run on self-will, who knows the end of that, can hardly be a success, right? You can do a lot in self-will. I, I, my, the first 40, odd years of my life were proof of that. I got, I did a lot. I prided myself on doing a lot, right? It kicked my patootie, mm -hmm. <laughs> says the person who's not swearing. It really did, right? So I could do it. Did it create peace? Did it create loving relationships? Did it create harmony? Did it create inclusiveness? It did not. Now, I thought this was worth talking about. As psychiatrists have often observed, defiance is the outstanding characteristic of many an alcoholic. Defiance is the outstanding characteristic of many an Al-Anon. Yeah. Our insistence on having our way, our refusal to look at our behavior, right? You know, that's defiance, right? Where we stand where we're sick and we pretend that we're not and we push people around, right? I love the definition I heard. I don't know who came up with this, but this definition of denial, don't even know I'm lying. When I was a fundamental Christian, I thought God would be mad at me if I lied, so I didn't lie. My whole life was a lie. My life was a lie. I was fundamentally dishonest in so many of the things I was doing, right? Now, I also think that denial is the shock absorber for the soul, right? So we come out of denial as slowly as we need to. Again, that reference to my religion when I got here and nobody pushed me around about that. In fact, the man that finally helped me understand that I needed to get free from that, said to me, I don't care what religion you're in. You can be in whatever religion you want to be in, but you might want to figure out if this is love or fear, right? I thought it was love, even though it didn't feel like it really, <laughs> right? It mirrored in some ways my upbringing with religion, where because of some things that happened in my family, I believed at a very young age that I was condemned by God and that God in the end was going to have to send me to hell because I was bad. Now that's what I believed. I started believing that when I was about six or seven. Whoops. <laughs> um, that's not really my family's fault, in my opinion. In my opinion, if I came here to heal funky stuff, funky stuff is going to happen to me. And in the end, it's my job to bring it to love and it's my job to bring it to light and it's my job to transform it. My job, not anybody else's, right? But that belief in a scary God really haunted me for a long time. 
and it took a long time to get over that. When I finally decided to leave that church, the man that was helping me at the time said, I mean, I got it. Oh my gosh, you guys, we did the inventory. I'd been in, I'd been in that church for almost 25 years. We did the inventory. The way I'm going to show you to do inventory. Thanks, Denora. You're saving me. <laughs> awesome. Uh, the way I was taught to do inventory using the columns. So I put the church in the first column, right? We can put people, places, or things, or what we write about. I walked it through the eight columns of the inventory, and by the time I was done with that writing, I knew I was in the wrong place. I, it was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> it was the coolest thing ever. It was very scary for me too, but it was also really cool, right? And I had just enough courage. I had just enough courage. I always want extra courage, buckets to throw around, hand out, have some courage, here you go. I never do. I usually have just enough to do what I need to do. And I left that church. And it was because of the inventory process that I was able to do that. It was a miracle, you guys. It was a miracle. But my sponsor said to you, me, okay, honey. He doesn't really call me honey. I call me honey. Uh. Okay, honey. <laughs> How long do you think it's going to take you to get over this? So I'd been in this organization 20 plus years. And I was like, I'm over it now. And he started laughing like that. He was like, let's give it a couple years. <laughs> and it took that long, right? It took that long to totally change my mind and let go. And um, I, I, I remember the night that I felt like it finally happened. They hound you to come back, right? They, uh, it's the only true religion. If you're not in it, you're condemned. If you leave, you're condemned forever. If you leave, your kids die. It was fabulous, just fabulous. <laughs> so much not fun. Um, and I remember the night I realized I was free, one of the elders in the church called me and I'm like, look, I know where you are. I know what you believe. If I need anything, I'll let you know. And I hung up the phone. It was, a, it, was a, it was a moment for me. Very cool. So are we defiant as Al-Anons? No. Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, I also thought it was interesting that it says belief meant reliance, not defiance. Mm -hmm. In AA, we see the fruits of this belief. My friends, we see it in Al-Anon too, right? Mm -hmm. We see people put down their cots and stand up and walk again as human beings, right? We see it in al too. Men and women spared from alcohol's final catastrophe. We saw, we saw them meet and transcend their other pains and trials, right? Seeking neither to run, running was one of my favorite things, running and hiding. Seeking neither to run nor to recriminate. This was not only faith, it was faith that worked under all conditions. Isn't that an interesting statement? We soon concluded that whatever price in humility we must pay, we will pay. We will pay it, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I finally got some of the heavy stuff off me through the work and the steps, I got about five years um, where I just, I played like there was no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I went to concerts, I stayed out late, I went camping, I left my kids with babysitters, I, I did things I, I, I hadn't done, right? And it was so much fun. The only thing wrong with that was it created, so I went from this God that even if I did my best was probably going to kill me. That's what that's what the belief was. You do the very best you can. I did that. But, you know, it's probably not going to be enough. And you're probably going to die at Armageddon. Mm -hmm. You know, I went from that God. Um, I got free of it. And, and then I kind of had a, I had a Santa Claus God. Why did I have a Santa Claus God? <laughs> because I was immature. That's why, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I will tell you that it felt appropriate <clears throat> on some level because I went from this tightly screwed down life where I didn't chance anything, I didn't try anything, I didn't do anything, to kind of the doors and windows came open, right? And 
it was good for my recovery to experience that that period of what well, I can do this if I I want to I was scared to get a debit card or a credit card I, I got a debit card somebody had to talk me into it but um, I got one <laughs> so much fun um, I went to uh, Metro State College and learned how to write I took their upper, upper level creative writing classes. I just really had a good time. And then I needed to go back into the work because you can't stay a 10 year old. Mm. It's a bad idea to stay a 10 year old. <laughs> but I just wanted to kind of relay that, that that was a part of my recovery that I, I am not ashamed of that and I don't have any bad feelings about it. It was good for me and it was kind of part of my journey. Ah. Mm. <sighs> What else did I want to read? I think that bled through from the other page. Um, I wanted to read the last paragraph. Therefore, therefore it says, step two is the rallying point for all of us. Whether agnostic, athe atheist, or former believer, we can stand together on this step. True humility and an open mind can lead us to faith and every AA meeting is an insurance that God will restore us to sanity if we rightly relate ourselves to him. What I read a little bit ago, I think, was it kind of relates to what I was talking about, too. You know, when I see people go through the really tough stuff, the really tough stuff, the really tough stuff, when my dad died, oh, that was rough. Oh, he was my guy, right? He lived to be 94, and I kept saying, you can make it to 100, Dad. You just have to get in there and try harder. Um, you know when people are sick and we can't help them? Oh, my God, it's heartbreaking, right? I don't try to talk myself out of that anymore. Like, well, see, it even just makes me like this just talking about it. You know, heartbreak is the right response to a lot of situations, right? It's okay to let your heart break. Let your heart break. Grieve. Get over it, right? And I don't mean get over it the way people used to say that to me. I mean go through it, right? Go through it, right? When we have a power greater than ourselves who never, ever, ever leaves us, my sponsor says we're 12 foot tall and bulletproof. I'm starting to click my glasses. We're 12, 12 foot tall and bulletproof, right? It isn't about getting your way, my friends. You're gonna get your way sometimes. I love it when that happens. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm in favor of that. <laughs> like, I love it when that happens. I'm not kidding you. I do happy now like there's no tomorrow. I'm really good at happy. I, I really, really am. But I let my heart break too and I get reliant on a power greater than myself to restore me to sanity and take me out of that pit of dependence where I just want to do the same thing over and over again, even though I can see it's not working, right? You don't have to manufacture the power to change your life. It will be given you. It will be given you if you are willing, right? It's there for the taking, right? When I want to be well, the universe pushes with me. It pushes with me, right? The right people show up. How did I come as an Al-Anon? How did I hook up with an AA sponsor who had long-term recovery to walk through this stuff that my Al-Anon sponsor did not know what to do with. Like, she didn't know how to help me. She's like, I, I don't know. That's a bad day. <laughs> That's a bad day, right? When your sponsor says, I got nothing, honey. I got nothing. So here's this man. And he's like, yeah, I can help you with that. All right, let's go, right? And when you see the way, when the way opens up before you, so my experience has been, I do the work, 
and suddenly there's a path forward. Suddenly, mm -hmm. after five years of grueling work, no, I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, <laughs> there's a path, right, that opens up in front of me. If I don't go down that path, that door shuts. That's mm -hmm. been my experience, right? Like the universe conspires you to give all the information you need about yourself to see what needs to change. The universe will speak with you, right? When I showed up at Al-Anon, oh my gosh, was the universe talking to me. It was saying, mm, this is not gonna be okay. It's not gonna be okay. It's getting worse, what are you gonna do, right? So, you know, um, we have this book at home called Power Versus Force. It's a fascinating book. You have to have a bigger brain than me to read the whole thing, but nevertheless. Um, my husband read it and then I gleaned all the, I just pulled all the good stuff out of him about this book and looked at the book myself. But it's a fascinating um, sort of, it's nonfiction, it's written in a very scientific matter. And what this man did is he calibrated where emotions vibrated on a scale, okay? You following me so far? So there was a dividing line, a, a clear dividing line between emotions that tear you up and make you sick, shame and guilt being the most powerful ones, right? Um, but you know, all those things that we engage that make us sicker, and then there's a dividing line. And if you get into emotions and beliefs above that line, they heal you. Now, this is, this is one of the things that just fascinated me. Um, the dividing line, the emotion that's at that dividing line is courage. Mm. Courage is the difference between staying down here, right, where it's bad and it's not going well and people are suffering, and moving above that into faith, um, into friendship, into tolerance, into unconditional love was at the level of 500, courage was at the level of 200. The lowest ones, the first two were shame and guilt. Um, I had a bunch of shame and guilt when I showed up here. Shame and guilt was kind of my operating system. It was not much fun, right? So interesting to me is in this book, this man who's not in any kind of a 12-step program said that 12-step programs vibrate on the level of unconditional love. Isn't that cool, you guys? I love it when I read stuff like that. Unconditional love. So 12-step programs vibrate on the level of unconditional love. Not all the people in them vibrate at that level. <laughs> we know this. 12-step programs, is, is we attract sick people, right? I'm a sick people. <laughs> I needed a lot of help, right, to do the things I needed to do. Um, but I love that idea that, the, that it's courage that moves us and we don't have to manufacture it, right? Like when I first got here, I called myself Chicken Little because this guy was always, pretty much always falling. I called myself the Little Red Hen. Do you guys know that story? Mm -hmm. Thanks, I'll do it myself, mm -hmm. right? I called myself the Rock of Gibraltar upon which people mm -hmm. break themselves. I was stoic, you know, I was defended. I was unavailable. I'm not like that anymore, largely. Mm -hmm. Unless something really, really is going on. So can somebody help me understand what time it is? Because I don't want to run, run us over. Quarter after six. No, it's not yet. Quarter after six? No, ten after. Ten okay. after? Okay. Okay, it's between 11 after and quarter after. <laughs> we got that. Um, so I wanted to um, read you guys some poems, and I wanted to talk a little bit about music. So my musical references for this step are, um, first of all, Let It Be. Mm -hmm. When I find myself in times of trouble, mm -hmm. Mother Mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Let it be, let it be, right? Mm -hmm. Step two is the beginning of that for me. Mm -hmm. 
of letting it be. Uh, Van Morrison, you guys are going to get the idea over time that, you know, Van Morrison is, you know, <laughs> he's the guy. <laughs> um, he has a song called Dweller on the Threshold, Dweller on the Threshold. I'm a dweller on the threshold and I'm waiting at the door. I've been standing in the darkness. I don't want to wait no more. I'm a dweller on the threshold and I've crossed the burning ground. I will go down to the water and let my great illusion drown. That's what you were asked to do, you know? We let go of the illusion. Um, another song that I love by Van Morrison, first step two is Be Thou My Vision. It's an old, old, old song. Mm. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Right? If you want to check that one out, it's pretty cool. And then Dead Man's Will, which is by Iron and Wine and Calixico, uh, which is about letting go and, and doing it different. What was the name of the artist? Um, Iron and Wine with Calexico, C-A-L-E-X-I-C-O. So check out those songs in case they're helpful to you. Um, then I've got a poem that I wrote called Crazy Girls that I'm going to read. Mm -hmm. And then before I read that, I wanted to do, this is, I might be the shortest Rumi poem there is. Do you guys know who Rumi is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. That's so cool. And Rumi says, somewhere beyond right and wrong, there is a garden. I will meet you there. Mm -hmm. I will meet you there. Let's let go. Let's let go of trying to decide who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. Let's let go of that, the wrong trinity, heroes, perpetrators, and victims, which is the triangle that al operate in, right? They've got to have a bad guy. They're often victimized. They love to be the hero. I like the hero role so much that I've actually saved a couple of lives. Kind of baloney. <laughs> but it's that need, right? To, to the hero is glorified, right? They're the one, right? The perpetrator is the bad guy. They're the reason why we're unhappy. The victim is absolved because nothing is their fault, right? So what that poem of Rumi says to me is, let's get outside of right and wrong. Let's go to that garden. Let's play there where there's no blame and no shame and no guilt. There are simply humans. There are simply human beings who are trying to figure it out, right? And, and, the, and, and the stuff that happens in our lives can be so difficult. But everything that happens, I believe, and this is just what I believe, it's life telling us you're in love, you're unafraid, Feel free to move about, right? Do whatever you want to do. Or you're in fear. And if you don't check in with somebody, if you can't get real about this, if you can't tell the truth about what's going on and look at your part only and work with your higher power to change that, then this is going to keep happening, right? You're going to bump into it, bump into it, bump into it. Um, my mom was my nemesis for a while. She, we had a complicated relationship. And I wrote a poem on the year anniversary of her death. I wrote a poem called Stay Dead One More Year. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I'll read it to you one night. It's a really good poem. And in the poem, she's tied to my leg. She's dead. She's tied to my leg. And she's going everywhere with me. Mm -hmm. Bump, bump, bump down the stairs, right? Uh, she gets, the car door gets slammed into her, but she doesn't care because she's dead. Mm -hmm. Heft her into the back. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, she's tied to my leg. There is no freedom there, my friends. There is no freedom there. And I thought, I always thought that my mom would come to me after she died so she could make amends to me. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's how my head works. <clears throat> um, my mom did come to me after she died. You know, you don't have to believe this. It's You can suspend, do whatever you need to do right now. <laughs> you don't have to believe this. Um, but she did come to me, and guess what happened? Anybody want to guess? She did make amends. She did not make amends. You made amends. I made amends to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you know what? I was a rough road for my mom. Mm -hmm. I scared her. I scared my mom. There was stuff happening in the family that wasn't related to her or my dad that made me so frightened. I was such a frightened human being that my behavior was like <laughs> right? I was a little kid and I was <laughs> about a lot of stuff, right? And my mom didn't have a solution. So that frightened her, right? Frightened people can't help people. Frightened people can't help people. You have to not be scared <laughs> to help people, right? So I made amends to her, which was so cathartic. I'm not kidding you. She's not tied to my leg anymore. Is she still dead? She is still, yeah. I don't know if she's still dead or not, because that's a whole different thing we could talk about. I kind of I kind of wish I did know where they were, my mom and dad. But um, my dad actually came to me when he died too. Um, my dad was a lifesaver to me. He was the sweetest man. and. Um, I went back to see him and got some time with him, which was very cool when he was dying. And I kind of wanted to stay because we knew it was going to happen. But I prayed about it and wrote about it and got the message to come back home to Colorado. He was in the Chicago area. And one night in the middle of the night at about 2 in the morning, I woke up out of a dead sleep and my dad was there. It was the coolest thing ever. And we had a nonverbal conversation. Oh my gosh, it was just so amazing. So amazing. I am not afraid to die anymore. I want to go where that guy was. <laughs> Wherever he was, it was good. You know, the joy and the hap the peace and the it was just the most wild experience and then he was gone and I woke up my husband Jerry and I said, "My dad was just here." It was just the coolest thing ever. And then my sister called me at about 6 in the morning, and he had died. And I didn't even know it. I didn't know he was dead. Yeah. Things happen, friends. Mm -hmm. Things happen, right? Things happen. But that was very healing for me. So I have one more poem. This is called Crazy Girls. I'm going to dedicate it to all of you, even the men. Um, I attract... Well, women who've been in AA long term and their Al Anon issues are killing them. Killing them. The, a lot of time that's who I end up working with, not always, but it's felt like a thing for a while. So this is more about working with alcoholic women, but, but you know, bear with me. See what you think. It's called Crazy Girls. Crazy Girls, I believe them. I listen a long time. Crazy girls don't trust just anyone. They fist a hand on hip and say, just look at that, and just look at this. The girls watch my face when they tell me about eating from dumpsters, hooking for crack, a baby who died, and the alcohol pool of her belly. Men are shadows. The crazy girls line them up. Wide shoulders, thick legs start to look like a chorus line turn kick turn kick sometimes a crazy girl will see what she's clutching pills booze men lots of sex no sex being right being wrong being loud and angry being quiet and small seeing is slow one bit of light at a time some of them die the girls need love but they do not know what clothes it wears, or which hat. They try on everything until they are tired, tired, tired. I keep my hands on their shoulders. Crazy girls are hard to turn. We're all hard to turn, right? It's hard turning. It's what we're here for. So let me look at my notes to make sure I did everything I kind of wanted to do. 
Yeah, so homework, try to keep in mind that if you read the big book, uh, it'll, it'll make you well. Uh -huh. I was having a hard time one time and I called a friend of mine who's very active in AA and she said, read your big book. And I'm like, I'm too freaked out to read that book. Mm -hmm. No swearing. <laughs> Almost <laughs> swearing, okay. She said, just go put your hand on it. I was like, mm -hmm. what? She said, just go put your hand on it. Uh -huh. And I did. And it helped. <laughs> it's like, that's the craziest thing ever. So read the big book. First 164 pages are where the meat are. Read the 12. This, I love Al Anon literature. I said that last week. I'm going to say it this week again. I love it. I read Al Anon literature too. This, this book, <clears throat> this is my favorite recovery book. It's the AA 12 Steps. Mm -hmm. 12 traditions. It will help you understand the steps and the traditions. I think it'll change your life if you read this book. I really do. I love this book. I've almost worn it out. It's waterlogged and weird. Um, if you want to, if you too like music or poetry and you want to bring a reference for step three next week, feel free. We might not get to all of them, but I think that would be kind of fun. Um, I've said it before, when you want to be well, the universe pushes with you. Um, music was a huge part of my healing and recovery. Like all of a sudden I'd hear this song and my heart would just open up. It was the coolest thing ever. I still listen to a lot of music that does that for me. Um, now what time is it? 6.24. I rock. <laughs> okay, um, a few minutes to talk about step two to ask questions, to do anything anybody want to say, share, anything? I should have brought coffee. I have a question about um, insanity, because for a long time I didn't think I was insane. Um, even in recovery, I didn't really think I had been insane. So. Um, I guess my experience is that insanity and how I've been um, kind of reveals itself along the way. I just wondered if you had any more insights about insanity at all or? Well, I, you know, I like the al definition, like repeating behavior yeah. that doesn't work is a great jumping off place for mm -hmm. people. I also really like it when the people I work with start paying attention to whether they're in relationships that are unconditional mm -hmm. with other human beings or are they trading, you know? I'll make you feel good if you make me feel good. Um, are they controlling? Are they tolerating things they should not be tolerating, you know? Mm -hmm. So to look at your relationships, and here's the thing, don't if you cannot judge it, that's incredibly helpful. Like one of the things my sponsor said to me when I was working through some stuff that was really tough was, he said, imagine that you're an angel and that you're sort of the angel in charge of Alice, right? And you have nothing but love for Alice. Like really friends, I don't ask God for forgiveness. Hopefully you won't think this is blasphemous. Because I don't think God ever judges me. Mm -hmm. He never judges me. Mm -hmm. God loves me. He wants what's best for me always. He never judges me. Now, other human beings, that's a different story. Yes, I do have to make amends to them and get things straightened up. Mm -hmm. But look at your relationships, you know. Do people feel comfortable around you? Do they have a sense of freedom and ease? You know, can you mind your own business? especially with your kids or your significant other. Can you say, huh, mm -hmm. that's interesting. <laughs> huh, <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. Huh, okay. <laughs> what, and, and, and staying in, people that can stay in right exactly where they are, that is what makes you able to act with love, right? If you're not in the moment, inside your body, connected to a higher power, then you're gonna have a hard time behaving well. And again, friends, 
I suck at behaving well. I'm not good at it at all, right? Without a second step and a third step and a knowledge that I don't have to manufacture courage, power, right? I don't have to manufacture it. I just have to be open to it, right? And it will come to me. It will come to me, right? So that I can do the next right thing and work on becoming the woman God would have me be, which is my goal. Mm. Some days I don't do, do a very good job. I was snarky at a business meeting this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> so I apologized to everybody that was there. I said that was snarky and uncalled for. Sorry. I'm having a little bit of trouble with change right now. <laughs> I went from, I've been in my job almost 13, well, 12 and a half years, something like that. I've never had a boss. So much fun. <laughs> Not having a boss. I had to do whatever I wanted to, pretty much, you know. And I worked real hard and I did a good job. Now I've got a boss, now I'm on a team. Mm -hmm. oh. All right, whatever. So I'm learning, I'm learning again. Anybody else got anything? I, I'd just like to say that originally, to my great surprise, the insanity part has continued to reveal itself. The longer I'm in the program, mm -hmm. the more I see where I slip into insanity. Mm. I mean, it, it wasn't like, okay, now I understand what it is and I'm not going to do that anymore. Yes. It's more like, what did you do that for? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so now, I don't beat myself up over it. But I can slip into it yeah. so easily. Yeah, there's another fellowship that I go to, and I love this saying that they have. They say, in times of extreme stress, and it doesn't even have to be extreme stress for me, in times of stress, your character defects will return. Mm -hmm. They will return. And then you'll get to work with them again, right? You get to work with them again. It isn't about, you know, I... I used to believe I was St. Alice, mm -hmm. good Lord in heaven. Um, I don't believe in that anymore at all. I'm not. I'm just a human, right? I'm just a human being. That's all I am. Same as everybody in this room. Same as everybody on the planet. Okie dokie, friends. Oh, I forgot to pass the basket. So we're going to do it now fastly, quickly, because I forgot. And then we'll close real quick with... Um, the Al-Anon Declaration. I love declarations. Yeah.